You know, my oldest daughter, Abigail, had a pretty rough start when she was born. She was born after 31 hours of labor, and when she came into the world, although I was ready to cut the cord, the doctor took her, whisked her off, cut the cord, hand her off to some nurses who took her over into the corner. Next thing I knew, they were performing CPR on her. Her heart wasn't beating, she wasn't breathing. We were told later that her APGAR number was only a one, which means she really should have died. It's amazing to me how well they cared for her. They took, not only did they care for her then, they took her into the NICU for the next four days, and, and, and she recovered and she grew, and, and now she's uh, one of the joys of my life. In, in that same NICU, there were a lot of babies that were born prematurely, which was kind of funny because Abigail was uh, full term. She was eight and a half pounds. So next to those one pound and two pound babies, she, she looked like she could eat all the other babies there in the NICU. Isn't it amazing the technology that we have been able to develop by the gift of God, giving us the gift of reason, creating us in His image, giving us an understanding of the world, how much good we can bring to the world through our technology. We can save lives. We, we, we can fix problems. We can cure diseases that were once thought to be incurable. And yet this same technology that allows us to save children, allows us also to peer into the womb, diagnose illnesses, and use that as a basis of a decision to abort those same children. Isn't it amazing that plastic surgery, which allows us to restore so much of the life of those who have been in really bad accidents, is also used to steal the life of teenage girls by creating false impressions of beauty that they're then held to in an airbrushed sort of way? How is it that technology that can bring such life to the world can also bring such death and destruction to the world? Listen, it's no secret our technology has far outpaced our ethics. We're doing things and we're only asking should we do them far later. In no area is this more true than in the area of biotechnology. Now, biotechnology is just, it's just a big word to describe when technology is applied to really living things. So medical technology would be an example of this. We're talking here about the beginning of life and the end of life and the way we remake life. All of those technologies. When it comes to biotechnology, the advancements are simply stunning. I mean, we're curing diseases we never thought possible. We're able to save lives at the beginning. We're able to prolong life at the end. It's really amazing. And yet the same biotechnology is really bringing a lot of threats to our understanding of human dignity. How do we think about something with such potential for good and such potential for evil? Well, here's a number of things. First, we have to understand what worldview is driving our science and medical technology. See, a worldview is the basic way that we see the world, the assumptions we hold about reality. One of the best illustrations of, about how a worldview works is a map. You know, a map helps you find where you are and where you're going. I mean, let's take, for example, the map at a mall. You know, let's say I'm shopping, which I never like to do unless it's December 24th, but I, I'm there and I, I, I need to find a Starbucks so I can make it through that hard day. But the wrong map from the wrong mall had been put in this mall. And so I'm there and I, I think I found the Starbucks, but I really don't know where the Starbucks is because it's the wrong map. I mean, that would be tragic. But not only that, what's the first thing we all look for on that map? That little yellow arrow that says, you are here. And if the wrong map was there, I wouldn't know where I was. Well, a worldview is even more important because not only if you have the wrong worldview, do you not know where you are, you don't know who you are. If we don't have a proper understanding of God and how He made the world, we won't have a proper understanding of who we are and that we're made in God's image. And, and a society like ours, which is so dominated by secularism, either assuming that God doesn't exist or that He's nothing more than our personal, private, imaginary friends and has no business in the public square, it's very clear that not only have we rejected God, but we have no idea what gives humans value and dignity and purpose. You know, David warns us about this in Psalm 135. It's a chapter in which he gives you all kinds of reasons why you ought to praise the God of Israel. Then after giving you these reasons, he contrasts the God of Israel with an idol. And he says, the idols of the nations are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have mouths but can't speak, eyes but can't see, ears but can't hear, nor is there breath in their mouths. Now, now we know that's kind of silly to take a block of wood and carve an ear on it and then start talking to it like it hears you. But that's not David's full point. In the very next verse, verse 18, he says, and those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. In other words, God has made us in such a way that we see ourselves in the image of whatever it is that we worship. Now, throughout Scripture, we're told that we're made in the image of God. So if we really want to know what a human is and what gives us value and purpose and dignity, we don't start by looking around. We start by looking at Him, and we realize that that dignity is inherent in the way that He's made us. But what if we miss God? If we miss God, we're going to miss humans. We're going to see ourselves in the image of whatever it is that we worship. And that begs the question, what is it that we worship in our culture? 
What is the idol of choice? Now, there's so many things we could identify. Let me just deal with the one. I think it's the primary one that we worship in our society. Stuff. We love stuff. We worship stuff. We want more stuff. We want the newest stuff, the latest stuff, the greatest stuff. And what do we do with it? We buy it, we sell it, we store it, and we throw it away when it loses its usefulness. Well, a culture that worships stuff is a culture that starts to see people as nothing but stuff. Let me take this just a little bit further. What gives stuff value to us? Two things, I think. Number one is whether it's useful to us. You know, maybe you're a carpenter or a mechanic and you will pay a high price tag for the right tool to do the right job because it's useful in your hands. I will never pay a high price tag for tools because they are not useful to me. They're actually quite dangerous, right? In other words, that usefulness isn't enough for me to justify the value. Not only that, but we also judge stuff or value stuff based on what it looks like. So there's all kinds of gadgets. We want the latest and greatest one. There's SUVs and minivans, but we want SUVs because they're cooler. Good heavens, even the National Academy of Sciences says that the only endangered species we save are the cute ones, right? So, so we judge stuff based on what it looks like and based on what it can do for us. Isn't that the same way people are valued and treated in our society? Right? So much technology is used to improve outward appearance. We, we judge the people at the end of life, whether they have certain functions. If, if a baby is diagnosed in the womb having Down syndrome or not being able to perform or not useful to society, abortion is not only recommended, couples often report being pressured into it. See, this bad definition of humanity is deeply impacting how we employ the technology that God has gifted us with. And what happens with our bad definition of human value is we start putting price tags on certain people based on what they can do or based on what they look like. And what happens when you put a price tag on something that's priceless is you cheapen it immediately. Now, how do Christians live in a culture in which human life is trivialized, in which our biotechnology is outrunning at such an incredible pace, our bioethics. How do we think well about technologies and medical treatments and procedures around us that are not only there, but they're actually accepted as normal? Well, there's a couple things. The first thing we have to go back to is a proper understanding and deep commitment to the idea that all humans are made in the image and in the likeness of God. That human value is not something that's acquired from the outside because of certain traits or certain characteristics. It's actually something embedded. And that all human beings have value from the moment of conception until the point of natural death because of the image of God that they bear. The next thing we have to do is we have to go back and understand the historic Christian position on issues of life and death. The second thing we need to do is we need to understand the historic Christian position on beginning and end-of-life issues. Now, you've heard this, that this whole fight against abortion and the pro-life position is nothing but a far-right Republican you know, position that was politically foistered on you know, religious conservatives. That is just not the case. The earliest extra-biblical document we have, the Didache, the teaching of the apostles, says, thou shalt not commit abortion. Now, Christians throughout history have not always been consistent on this, but it's one of the earliest stances that the church took on a social issue. And not only that, but they fought to defend the dignity of all life. And that's why Christianity led to the freeing of the slaves and to lifting up women from oppression and, and, and led to education for all and so many other goods that Christianity brought the world. The third thing we need to do is we need to stay up to date on technological developments. One of my favorite sources for this is the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity. You can find them at their website, cbhd.org. The technology comes fast and they stay on top of it and they'll inform you as to what's happening. And you need to decide now, once you get informed, where you stand on these issues. The time to decide is not when you're facing the crisis itself and all this technology is available to you. You need to decide up front what constitutes a respect for human dignity and what does not. Make these decisions and stay by them. Make them before the situation happens. And in our conversations with everyone else, we need to pay attention to language. Language is used to cover up evil. This has happened in the abortion position where somehow the intentional taking of an innocent human life before birth is called pro-choice or reproductive freedom. It happens when it comes to cloning, where we hear the distinction between reproductive and therapeutic cloning. 
The thing is, is once you produce an embryo, which all cloning does, it's reproductive, whether it's allowed to grow into a, a, another human being or whether it's not. And we need to call out these language games when we see it. And the only way to do that is if we're informed and we're able and willing and courageous enough to have these conversations. These conversations about definitions can be very powerful across a, a backyard fence or at Starbucks in terms of swaying cultural opinions on these things that have such dire consequences. And finally, we need some Christians to see the world of biotechnology as a mission field. Doctors, nurses are facing incredible decisions that they have to face. These guys are missionaries in our society defending the, the dignity of human life. Same thing's true for professors and, and, and researchers and theologians and, and cultural commentators and journalists as they report on these things. We need to train a new generation to go in and defend the dignity of life. Listen, cultures either bring life or cultures bring death. Cultures either create space for human flourishing or cultures steal human flourishing and bring dehumanization. And biotechnology and medicine is a key way that this happens. So Christians, church, we have got to commit ourselves to defending the inherent worth and dignity of all human people because this idea that humans are made in the image of God are not just words on a page in a dusty old Bible. What they are is words that accurately describe the way that God actually made the world. And this should inform how we live and interact with each other.